So in this clinical video, we're going to demonstrate how to take good quality records, which will be intraoral and extraoral photographs, and um, good quality impressions, which you can either prop in stone cast or what we do, reverse scan into an e-model. Uh, three things that I look at for my diagnosis, the radiographs, which we've already uh, ordered on the day of the consultation. Uh, this is the second visit, and at the second visit we're taking records, which we call photos and impressions visit, or PNI, and that is um, the study casts uh, and the uh, extra roll and intra roll photographs. And um, today we have Angelina with us. Angelina is nine, I'm thinking. Yes. Uh, you're not nervous today, are you? No. No. You know what we're doing today? No. Okay. We're going to take some photos of your teeth and some photos of your face, so I can put them on the computer. Next time you're here, I can show mum and dad exactly what we're gonna do with your teeth, okay? okay. Do, you, do you like your teeth at the moment? What, what would you like to improve about your smile? Um, make them more white. More white, okay, well, we can do that after we straighten them. But at this stage, uh, we need to make a little bit more room for your teeth, okay? So, to take our photographs, we have a um, medical grade intraoral, extraoral camera, uh, single lens reflex uh, unit. We've been buying cameras for the last 20 years from a company in the United States uh, called Dyne Corporation. And um, Lester Dyne set this company up specifically for dental photography. So he makes a kit so you don't have to source the different items. You have the lens, um, the ring flash, and the digital data back. So the variabilities you'll need to learn are what settings to use for intraoral versus extraoral. It's all to do with the aperture. For the extraoral photograph, we are opening our aperture uh, to 5.6. For the intraoral, we close our aperture down to uh, 22. But every time we take a photo, we're looking at the back to make sure that it's recorded well. This dying kit is even easier because it shows you in the focusing ring what you can do. So you can go from a tooth, single tooth, to the smile shot, um, to doing a intraoral and extraoral. And uh, it's giving you a guide as to what aperture stop to use. Uh, so the camera, I think, is the most important tool when it comes to uh, capturing good quality records. Too many uh, doctors I see skimp on this, and then the uh, records are not the standard that we require. So we're gonna run you through how we use this, how we use the uh, mirrors, uh, the photographic mirrors, and the photographic uh, retractors. Another common error I see, many dentists use their um, retractors to take photos, the same retractors they used to put braces on, like the NOLA retractor. That's not gonna work uh, either. So we'll go through the protocol step by step and we'll start by introducing you to the different mirrors that we use. So this is our intraoral mirror. The reason we use this model, and it comes in three sizes, uh, small, medium, large. This is the small, which we'd use typically for a nine-year-old. And this is the occlusal component, and this is the buckle component. So when you're taking the buckle shot, um, we are retracting on one side and putting this on the other side, so I'm taking a photo of her right buckle segment. This would go in like that. We would extend this way and we're shooting at 90 degrees to that reflection. We've designed a upper retractor because we found the normal intro retractors don't give us a good occlusal view. So with the same mirror, I will ask the child to open wide. We would then place that on the upper or the lower we would then shoot again at 90 degrees to that mirror. This is what was commercially available on the market for a upper or lower intro photograph. And we just found these were very difficult to use and you still got a lot of the lip in the way. So we've designed uh, these. Uh, this was initially um, a model that was available in Australia uh, by a Dr. Uh, Jenner. And it's... Um, uh, now we source these from uh, a dentist in New Zealand. These are excellent because they've got a long handle, so it's easy to hold, even the patient can hold that. 
And again, we're going to put this on the upper lip and retract and put our mirror in this direction. And you'll see that as we do those photos. So I think that's an essential tool. These are the intraoral retraction. And um, you can see there's a large and a small size, depending again on the age of the child. The larger ones for adults, and you can see compared the difference here if I put all three next to each other, you can see small, medium, large. And these are really to retract the cheeks so that we can get a good intraoral photograph from the front, as well as when we do our buckle segment shots, uh, one side is retracted so that you can put the mirror nicely on the other side. And these are the sort of tips that we will be uh, demonstrating uh, uh, for you. Now, after we've taken the photographs, we're going to take impressions of the teeth. And uh, for that, again, it's very important to use an orthodontic impression tray. Uh, most of the crown and bridge trays, the sulcus step is not good. Particularly if I'm making something like a Frankel appliance, I will actually green stick um, the sulcus step to get the right vestibular uh, impression. So our trays then come again in five sizes. We uh, don't need to use any fix or spray because the alginate flows through quite nicely these holes. And um, this uh, concept then allows us to get the most accurate impression and the good sulcus depth. So um, just for the kids' uh, sake, we also flavor our um, alginates. Uh, believe it or not, we're up to 15 flavors now. It just makes it a fun experience for the kid. Um, uh, and we try and take our impressions ideally when the patient's in this upright position. I know many people are taught uh, dentistry where the impressions are taken in the supine position. We designed for young kids, much better for them uh, to do it sitting up. For nervous children, we actually take an impression with the child looking at their own eyes in the mirror. And I'm going to demonstrate that uh, today as well. So the first photograph we're taking is just the photo identification. Um, I've seen some people put uh, band-aids on patients' faces and things like that with a number. We just ask them to hold the file and um, that way we know where the records will end up. Thank you very much. Yep. Now we're going to take the first of six extra old photographs. The first photograph is um, just natural posture. Now this is very important because some children, their natural posture might be like this. And I want to record that because it shows airway. Whereas um, some people take a photograph and the kid will do this for the photo. That's not natural. So look for natural posture, extra oral. Then we take the same photo again, but with a big smile. Now I know you can do a big smile because a minute ago you were laughing. Can you think of something funny and give me a big laugh? That's it. That's the one we want. Great. All right, ready? A big, big you, look, look, you look there at Dr. Con. Yeah, that's it. And big smile. But you really got small. Big laughing, laughing. Get the saying? That's it. That's the one. Great. Good. Now, now we're going to take two more photos, one smiling, one not smiling, but I want you to look over at my nurse there. Can you do that? So point your feet. Anyone on school photo? Yeah. Great. So lips together, breathe through your nose. Just natural posture for the yeah. lips, yeah. Looking a bit lower, that's a good bit. The eyes, that's a good bit. So this is called the oblique or 45 degree photo, and we take it with and without smile. Good. So now, with the big smile again, looking the same way. Yeah. Big smile, big smile, laughing, laughing. Great. Okay, now you're going to turn 90 degrees, so you're going to turn this way, and I want you to look straight out the door, right? Point your feet that way. Good. Okay. In this photo, it's very important that the hair is um, off the face. Many times I see photographs uh, that doctors have taken with glasses on. There's no need for that. Um, many times I see the hair over the face. We want to look at the mandibular plane angle. If you want to achieve natural head posture, the ideal thing is for a child just to look at their own eyes in the mirror and that achieves that um, uh, posture. So I normally ask the nurse okay, to hold that. Now what I'd like you to do is can you look, can you see yourself in there? Can you see your, look at your eyes in the mirror? Great. And then we'll take the two photos which will be the um, 90 degree extra oral. And then the next photo, I want you to give me a really big smile. Keep looking at your 
eyes in the mirror there, right, and give you a big smile, like you last time. Big, big smile. Perfect. Great. So that's our six extra oral photographs. So now we're going to take photographs inside the mouth. Um, the mirrors tend to uh, fog, uh, so we would have already warned these and we warned the child about that. Alternatively, there are mirror kits you can buy now, uh, which have an anti-fogging uh, uh, fan. Uh, I don't think there's a real need for that. However, we'll talk about both those options. The most important thing, of course, those when you're taking a photo and the patient's breathing, uh, we want to um, demist uh, that shot. So can I get you to pop these glasses on for me? That's the girl. All right, now we're going to put those retractors that I showed you into your mouth. And we're going to put our aperture setting, which was uh, 5.6 for the extra oral. We're now doing an intra oral, which is an uh, aperture setting of f22. But again, it varies from camera to camera. Always have a look at the quality. You might change the aperture one stop up, one stop uh, down. Right, so you want to go through there? Right. So the first intra oral photograph is taken with the retractor. It's important the patient has the correct bite. Many children, when you put the retractors in, will push their jaw forward. And then if that's recorded as the photo, it's the incorrect bite. Now we do a second shot, which is the overbite shot. So can I get you just to put your chin up a little bit for me? This is either the overbite or overjet. If it's a big overjet, I like to put a, um, a ruler in the mouth and photograph from the side. In this particular case, we have a div 2 and a deep bite, but if I had a really increased overjet, uh, if I had something like an enlarged label frenum, um, if I had a fractured tooth, uh, if I had a, a fused tooth, germinal tooth, I'd take a one-to-one -one photograph just of that. They're the additional photos to the standard six intraoral, six extraoral that I require for my diagnosis. So a good way to record an increased overjet, we will get some black uh, cardboard. We put the black cardboard here, which highlights the teeth when you take the photo, and then we'll place the ruler here so we can get a measurement of the overjet. Okay. We're now going to do the intraoral um, buckle shot. This is the one I find most doctors don't do well. Many doctors just try and retract the cheek as much as possible. You'll never be able to see the second molar if you do that. Uh, so what we're using is the intraoral mirror. Okay, good. So the nurse, the nurse stands behind and retract her cheek retractor in one hand, mirror in the other. Mirror enters horizontal, then she make, turns it over so it's, the mirror lies vertical. We get the patient to bite together gently. Now I control, as a, the photographer, I control the photo. I can, once I've focused on the, on the shot, I don't take my shot, I make sure it's, it's ideal. Now my nurse has been doing this for a while, so I could probably take the shot, but if I need to adjust it, I can simply pivot the mirror forward, up, down, but most importantly, I can actually pull the mirror away on the distal portion to allow me to get further back in terms of in, in more teeth in the photo. Then I can adjust myself so I can be parallel to the occlusal plane. So now the same photo on the other side, so the doctor will swap, the nurse will change the retractor from the right to the left using the same mirror coming in from this side. Okay. Now the last two intro photos before we do the smile shot, and we'll talk about uh, with the new concept in orthodontic diagnosis based not just on straight teeth but smile design such as um, the uh, buccal corridor width such as the smile arc, uh, we'll take one photograph which will just be there. But before we do that, we've got two more intra oral, which is the upper and the lower. This is where we're going to use the new Jenna style retractor. Same aperture setting, which is intra oral F22. And you'll see, just relax your little bit over there, that's the goal. Big R for me, wide as you can go, R, R, R. Great. 
You're in big R. Why does you can go good girl? You're doing really well here. Really good, really good. And get one more. Get one more. And just in case you, you can't see your sevens in the photo, sometimes you just need to drop the mirror down and then you get a better occlusal shot. Okay, good. So now to do the lower intraoral, upper retractor, same retractor, put in the lower, um, same mirror, inverted, 90 degree photo. Okay. Can place that. Good, that's the go. Great, open nice and wide. Here, the tongue needs to go above the mirror because otherwise if the tongue is in this photo, it'll sit over the lower molars, you won't get a good photograph. She's had a, a lingual oh, tongue tie. Just out of interest in this particular case, so. this young lady's just had a lingual phrenectomy using a soft tissue diode laser. I'm not show you that just to see how quickly that heals um, and why so many kids do need uh, uh, tongue ties uh, released so that the tongue can elevate onto the palate. That out. That's going again. Put the tongue. Put the tongue down, put your tongue on the floor, that's it. Uh, that'll be better. Just make it, make, you make your tongue a little bit smaller, that's it. Perfect. I don't know why that works, but it always does. So when, when a patient smiles here, we want the natural smile because many times we're designing our bracket position based on the smile arc and if they've got a gummy smile or not. So big smile, natural smile, that's the one. Okay, so, so if we just look here, here's a good example. So I'm going through, through that photo. So she actually has three smiles, right? So she has her, just, just relax for a second, okay, good. She has this sort of smile, then big, big smile. That's the natural one, you can see. Now, the way you can tell the natural smile, I mean, you've all heard that saying when Irish eyes are smiling, it's true. Look at um, uh, abicularis uh, oculi when she really smiles versus when she doesn't smile. So just, um, just smile like you did before, but not, not don't laugh, just a, not, that's it. Now, if you look at this smile, there's no action there, right? But give me, a, you, you can laugh now for me, big, big smile, like look at the eyes straight away and that's the natural smile. That's the photograph that we want because that's what we're planning um, on. It's very important in orthodontics uh, to capture the essence of that smile. Uh, we've in the past even um, ask the patient uh, to talk and smile on video and then you get more natural idea of what uh, their, their amount of tooth display is, is, is like. When we take our photos we actually just keep a log for our typist um, to confirm which photos belong to which patient and the typist job uh, we have a girl who does all our letters and at the same time uh, makes our templates for the photos her job is to crop the photos, enhance the colour if need be, and present them in the template that we like, and to make sure that she doesn't mix up uh, names and uh, patients. Uh, we log the date, the name of the patient, which photo we started on the camera, which is written on the back, and which photo we ended. Might sound um, a little bit archaic, but we find it works for us in a busy practice when we have eight cameras in use. Uh, we want to make sure that the book belongs to that camera. So the code of the camera and the code of the book uh, correlate. Many times when we set the tray, people think, well, we'll go for small and we'll do a small upper and lower. If you individualize, you'll find that um, in this particular patient's case, we're using the small lower um, and the next size up upper. Uh, and that way we're getting a more accurate impression to, to begin with. So don't get in the habit of saying, oh, well, small, medium, large. Um, looks like a small and so therefore we're going to small up a small lower. Actually try the tray in because the more accurate the impression the more data we can get from that. So we've used numerous brands of alginate. The one we keep going back to, it's not the cheapest but it's uh, so consistent, is Chromapan. It's made in Italy and um, what we like about it is its um, stability after taking the impression is 100 hours. Uh, for those people who don't have their own internal lab, that might be worth a, a good aspect in that you don't have to pour the alginate up, you can ship it in that time. Uh, the second thing is uh, it's um, colour changes, so it's purple as you mix it, it goes to pink before you put it in the mouth and then it sets white. For nervous children, you put a little bit of that 
uh, on their uh, finger. And um, we say, look, watch that uh, color change like magic. Um, young kids like this appreciate that. When they know it's changing, they know it's going to be coming out of their mouth soon. A lot of the anxiousness goes, uh, goes away. We will use two flattened scoops. So this is a crumb pan alginate. We'll go flatten the top, pour it into our little bowl for our automatic mixer. One, and we'll take a second scoop. Usually the alginate's like just a little bit fluffed in the mornings, which is nice. And so then we have, we usually keep this by the, on the windowsill, um, just so the, the sunlight heat, heats and warms it up, so the alginate sets a little bit faster. We, if you, I don't know if you can still see, we have some lines drawn on the alginate, on the water, and that correlates with what we've measured in terms of the correct dose for the alginate. So I squeeze the bottom. And it... We have two different types of automatic mixers. Um, today we're using the older one, this is my personal favourite. Got a dial to set how fast, how long you want the alginate to mix for. My nurses usually set it for about eight. I like it at about 10 to 12. Um, but I will leave it at eight today, so we've got a bit more time for the demo. So, get our tub, the water that we've measured. We pour it without squeezing the bottle. Put our lid on. And you can see the lid, it's got the little part that spatulates. It essentially goes like so, and we turn the lid as per the directions. Then we open the top of our mixer. And you can see the mixing element that we just put our bowl into, close it, and we simply push the button. Then the alginate comes out, and it should be nice and purple. It's pink now, purple, turning pink. And we gather it all up. And you can see that's a great mix of alginate, it's great consistency. The accuracy of these impressions is, is quite amazing. And the fit of our appliances is, is a testament to that. And we load the tray and we've got to get, quickly get that in the mouth before it turns white. Talking about anxious uh, patients for impressions, three techniques. Um, one is to ask the child to lift their legs, uh, right leg, left leg, both legs together. Another is to take the impression actually over the sink um, so that they're looking at their own eyes in the mirror. If there is any mishaps, they're over the sink anyway. But you find when they start looking at their own eyes, uh, they tend not to gag. We have also, with limited success, tried salt on the tip of the tongue. Um, uh, but I think the one that works consistently is the looking at your own eyes in the mirror over the sink. And in a minute, we'll demonstrate that. So you can see the um, reason we use this uh, alginate. It, um, when it's initially mixed, it's a purple color. It then goes through a pink phase. When it's white, we know it's set, and it sets very quickly. Um, for nervous children, we put a little bit on their finger, and we say, look, watch the color change. It distracts them. Um, sometimes we ask them to lift their legs. I'll show you a few techniques that we use for nervous children for taking the impressions. And remember, we do a lot of impressions. I mean, 30, 40, 50 a day. We sort of get a sixth sense of which kid will cope with it, which won't. It's also a good Yartsik indicator um, uh, for cooperation. But many children we're seeing have airway obstruction, so it's half of them to have this alginate take if they can't breathe through the nose. Just want to show the uh, impression. Right. So that's our lower impression now, the upper, and you can see the color is now purple. Just show the color. Yep. And um, we don't put it in the mouth till it goes pink, and then of course we leave it in the mouth till it goes white. Jeez. Very simple. You saw how quickly that set. Yeah. So you always make sure there's not too much excess on it. This little, and it's a very well mixed alginate. You can see there's no porosities at all. And um, dentistry 101, I think we've learned how to do this. And then you'll really learn how to do it once you start doing it so load it back. Big, big arc would go. Here it's very important to get the upper lip over the tray. Because if you don't, you'll get a impression of the lip um, and not of the teeth. So we can see here, this is one where sometimes um, children may start gagging, particularly if they've got airway obstruction. So what we do do is, can you do me a favor? Can you lift your leg up? Lift, lift your right leg up. That's it, right up, okay, higher, higher, just there. Good, now put that down. And put your, sorry, do one thing. Left leg up, 
high as you can. Good girl. Good. Great. Now, can you put both your legs together and try and lift both your legs up at the same time? Wow, you must be a little athlete. That's fantastic. Really, really good. By the time you've done that repetition, the alternate's already set and the child's forgotten about what's in their mouth. When there's, a full, when there's full occlusion, it's not too difficult to take a wax bite, so we make sure it's accurate, but we do take a, just a simple a single layer wax bite. However, in the cases where there are more complexities where it's harder to hand articulate the models, then we will use a two to three layer back wax, wax bite um, in the more traditional method. And again, with a wax bite, it's very important that the patient is in the habitual bite position, meaning children again will posture forward. And um, if you have a patient who's constantly bringing their jaw forward, one tip when you send them to the radiologist, I actually send them sometimes with the wax bite. So then the radiologist knows where the kid should be biting to take the x-rays. Uh, the bigger the overjet, the more chance of the radiologist taking the lateral ceph without the back teeth in occlusion, which throws all our cephalometric data out. So for anxious children, this is a really good technique. We take the upper impression over the sink and I get them to look at their eyes in the mirror. All right, come on, we'll do that. So keep looking at your eyes in the mirror and then you breathe through your nose. Make sure not to push the piston. Yeah, open a little bit, open a little bit. Load the back, put, sit the back of the tray first and then we come forward. Open, open, open. And yeah, we come up under the lip. And we muscle trim as well. So in the event that we do have an adverse experience, it all ends up in the sink and not in us. It's not embarrassing for the patient either, which is good. However, with the mirror, they tend not to gag. Too easy.